Today I want to talk about something that's been in the news almost every day, probably multiple times, and it's uh, artificial intelligence, or AI. So I'm going to use this uh, little cartoon that I drew uh, of a little robot. I'm going to use th this guy to uh, depict uh, an AI, which could be a, a robot or a driverless car, or just a, an algorithm running somewhere uh, allocating resources. And I'm going to ask the question of um, how do we handle the challenges that come with this technology? So on one hand, AI promises many benefits, uh, from better recommendations for restaurants and movies and even romantic partners, to safer cars, to a more accurate medical diagnosis, and a whole bunch of other benefits. But AI also raises many challenges uh, that people are talking about uh, very frequently in the media, from uh, algorithms that filter news, putting us in filter bubbles, um, to unfair matching in markets, to uh, mass unemployment, of course, and a whole bunch of other challenges. So how do we balance the benefits and the risks? Now, one idea that is commonly discussed is that we always need a human in the loop of these systems. Um, so it would look something like this. You've got uh, an AI that is uh, performing a function. Let's say it's uh, flying a plane. Uh, you always need to put a human in the loop, like a captain in the cockpit, and this person would uh, ensure that the system behaves in accordance with our plans and desires, and also is able to intervene uh, in case something goes wrong. And maybe more importantly, we have somebody to blame if something goes wrong. Now, an interesting thing to notice about this picture is that everybody here has the same goal. So most passengers, I would hope, would require uh, uh, getting from A to B safely. Maybe there are exceptions. But uh, in many cases, our systems would uh, perform functions in which there are multiple goals, and these goals may be in conflict. So somebody may be interested in fairness, so another person cares more about efficiency, and yet another person cares more about safety. And these goals may not be simultaneously achievable for whatever reason. Now, so how do we agree on these goals first before we tell the machine what to do and have the, the human in the loop intervene? So this is uh, less like a human in the loop challenge and more like a society in the loop challenge, where by society in the loop here, I mean a human in the loop plus a social contract between the stakeholders who care about different things. Um, and the social contract is meant to provide the agreement in which, uh, into which people would opt in in order to cooperate to their collective benefit. It's a necessity. And this social contract is not really a new idea. It's been around for a while, uh, at least 350 years. Uh, next year, uh, this is the uh, book Leviathan by uh, political philosopher and economist Thomas Hobbes. Uh, and Thomas Hobbes's innovation was to identify this notion of legitimacy of the sovereign power that doesn't come from above. It doesn't come out of nothing, but it comes out of the mutual consent of those who are governed. So if you zoom in on this sovereign, this all-powerful sovereign looking over the land here, you see that it's made up of hundreds of little people who have opted into the social contract by giving up some of their individual rights and freedoms in order to maintain this uh, sovereign's power to enforce uh, property rights as well as other rights. And of course, if these people would opt out of this contract, this very powerful thing would immediately cease to exist. Now, Hobbes made this sovereign very powerful. He said that this sovereign should have almost all power short of taking people's lives. But then we spent many decades, actually centuries, taming this Leviathan. And we did this by introducing many checks and balances on its power, introducing fundamental rights that it cannot violate, and a whole bunch of other uh, political developments since then. And today, as we think about uh, uh, technology, it's important to realize that we've created and maintained and tamed the Leviathan through a social contract. So today, as we build a techno-Leviathan, a kind of cyborg sovereign that is made up of humans as well as algorithms making decisions that impact us, we also need a kind of social contract that is also algorithmic. And I want to talk a little bit about the nature of this thing. Now. Uh, how do we, and how do we tame it? So 
Before we discuss this, we need to talk about what things regulate. And I can't think of a better uh, uh, source of or classification of things that regulate than Larry Lessig's uh, regulation architecture. So there is Larry in the middle. He's being regulated. And uh, he's regulated by four major forces. This is from his book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, which was very influential in the 90s as the internet was starting. So uh, law is, a, is one of the main regulators. This is what governments do. Uh, but also social norms, markets that set prices on different behaviors and objects, but also architecture. And by this, he means both the physical architecture, the built architecture, uh, but also the information architecture, things like the design of cyberspace. So how is algor the algorithmic social contract changing this picture? And I think on one hand, it's uh, introducing uh, a new kind of actor that requires regulation. So we are humans still, but we're regulating new kinds of actors. So instead of Larry in the middle here, we have our little robot. And this robot is uh, being regulated by similar forces. This could be, uh, uh, for example, a bunch of uh, programs trading in an algorithmic trading market. Uh, or it could be a driverless car that is moving around urban spaces, uh, and so on. Now, on the other hand, we have now AI-driven regulation of human behavior as well. Because, again, going back to this picture and putting Larry again in the middle, uh, the law is now uh, becoming AI augmented. Predictive policing is telling police where to police. Um, it, it, judges are using uh, algorithms to inform their parole decisions and so on. The markets are now using uh, algorithms to allocate buyers and sellers, uh, for instance, in peer-to-peer -peer markets or ride-sharing markets. Um, the information architecture is being mediated by algorithms uh, as well, deciding what information we see out of the sea of uh, of information out there, and even norms are being uh, altered by these algorithms. For instance, think of uh, dating websites and how they alter the kinds of relationships that humans form. So I think it's important to think, as, as we think about how this picture is changing, it's important to think about what has remained the same and what has changed. Because I think things that remain the same means, mean that we can still use some of our old tools uh, to regulate this new environment. So one of the things that remains the same is opacity. And th consider, for example, teaching a machine uh, right from wrong, like what to do. Of course, you know, on one hand, we have difficulty articulating our goals to machines, but we've always had difficulty articulating goals to humans. We also had difficulty trusting other humans, uh, and now we have difficulty trusting other machines to comply with these goals and constraints. And of course, even well, even well-intentioned goals can sometimes uh, go out of control. You know, you could tell a robot to uh, minimize misery, and it kills all people because that's one way of achieving that goal. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> so there is something wrong with this picture of requiring programmers to ensure that their machines are ethical before they let them into the wild. Uh, and I think it's because this goal is actually quite a tall order to ask of programmers. You don't ask people to open up other people's brains to check uh, if they're ethical by looking at their brain architecture. This is just unrealistic. Instead, what we do is we uh, observe people's behavior, and then we hold it up. Uh, we evaluate it against set standards of conduct. The second thing that hasn't really changed much is the presence of uns unsolvable dilemmas. So, the very common one that is, uh, I've been partly responsible for popularizing is the uh, ethical dilemma that a, an autonomous car may face. So the story goes the car has uh, somehow lost control, is going to kill some pedestrians, but is able to swerve and kill maybe its own passengers uh, in order to save more pedestrians. Um, again, many people think that you know, AIs should solve this problem, but this problem is fundamentally unsolvable. That's that's exactly why it's called a dilemma. It's by definition unsolvable. And it's really a tall order to expect machines to solve a problem that defied the best legal minds and ethical philosophical minds for thousands of years before we adopt the technology. But that is not to say that we can't solve these problems. We can't have a measured or a, 
a reasonable way forward. For instance, just think of this uh, mousse bar dilemma, right? I'll call it, which is this uh, metallic bar that is placed in, the fr in front of the car. Um, if you remove these uh, bars, this mousse bar, it's also called a kangaroo bar or a roo bar in Australia, depends on what kind of animal you might hit. Um, these things, removing them would reduce the risk of injury by 21% to pedestrians and the risk of death by 6%, um, which is why they are banned in many parts of Europe. They're banned in Australia, but they're not banned in the US. So there, we are constantly making trade-offs you know, about the risks that we're willing to put up with, uh, relative risks in this case, that are defined by some kind of social contract. So we can continue to do the same with machines that are intelligent. A third thing that is the same is our own psychological bias. You know, we're, we're still human, we still reason about the world in particular ways. Um, so recently in our research, we're, we're preliminary research uh, that is uh, uh, trying to overcome these kinds of dilemmas. So we've shown people uh, their lifetime odds of dying from being in a regular car versus an autonomous car as you know, according to the projections of the safety benefits of those cars. And people say, okay, that's good, I, I, I like that. But that does nothing to alleviate people's concern about being sacrificed by the car. Okay, and, and these concerns alone, despite of the absolute reduction in risk, may dissuade people from adopting the cars. And we've seen this before, right? Uh, the lifetime odds of dying from a car accident are astronomically higher than dying from a plane crash, yet many more people are afraid of flying uh, air travel uh, compared to getting in a car. And again, we need to educate people about reasoning about risk in order to overcome these kinds of psychological biases. So these are things that are uh, similar, that are not new. I think, so what's different? One thing that is different is the theory of mind. So in, um, in the current regulation, in the current social contract, we, have, we are regulating entities that are humans. We have some sort of theory of mind of how they might behave, what they're interested in, and, and what they dislike and, and like. Um, and we do the same thing with those who govern. But with machines, uh, we have a new kind of agent that is slightly different. So uh, psychologists Kurt Gray and, and colleagues have done a research on how we perceive other minds, including the minds of humans, the minds of uh, pets, and the minds of robots. And as you can see here, uh, uh, we perceive humans as being high on agency, the ability to make autonomous decisions, uh, as well as high on experience, the ability to experience pain, pleasure, and so on. But you can see here that the robots are uh, high on agency to some degree, and they're actually moving further along the x-axis here, but they're very low on experience. We don't know how to reason about these kinds of agents as we regulate them. For one, uh, we can't punish them because they don't care about pain. And I think this is a fundamental shift that we have to think about as we form this new social contract. A second thing that is different is adaptation beyond the initial intent in a completely unpredictable manner. So, for example, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission defines market manipulation as an intentional conduct designed to deceive investors. But attributing intent to a synthesized strategy that includes machine learning that adapts the strategy over time is an extremely difficult thing to do, which makes it very difficult for us to point to the cause behind or the intent behind some behaviors. Um, a third thing that is different is speed. So as systems become faster and faster, for instance, uh, algorithmic trading uh, uh, systems, the speed up can generate new, entirely new, entirely new uh, behavioral regimes. Uh, for example, uh, much more frequent flash crashes. And this happens precisely at the point where, these, uh, where humans lose the ability to intervene in real time in these kinds of systems. Uh, which brings up a whole lot of new challenges. So we could slow down the machines somehow. Uh, we could find ways to, to uh, uh, keep them running at, at a speed that we can keep, keep up with. Uh, but obviously, this type of solution means that we have to slow down uh, our ability to benefit from those machines as well. 
Um, and if we were, if we took this to the extreme, apply this precautionary principle, uh, I would be sitting here, uh, and we would all be cavemen and women, and I'd be telling you about the catastrophic consequences of using fire, holding holding uh, civilization obviously from progressing forward. So one way of handling this uh, challenge of speed is to use other programs, to use programs to watch other programs. So obviously, uh, instead of uh, having uh, a human here in the loop watching the, algorithm, the, the, the robot or the AI, we can have another AI watching it. This is what some people have referred to as oversight programs, which I think is going to be increasingly common. Of course, there are always limits to this, because then who watches the algorithm who's certifying the first algorithm? And obviously, this can go only so far until you run out of material to build more powerful machines. Uh, but I think it gives us some room to move. So just kind of wrapping up, the algorithmic social contract is going to change the, our picture of regulation in two ways. Uh, it's going to change the kinds of actors that we regulate, and it's going to change the way that we regulate humans as well. So the picture looks something like this, where you have algorithmic actors that are being regulated by algorithm augmented uh, regulatory forces, which kind of put, brings a question of what is left for us to do, but that's for a different talk. <laughs> now, one more thing. Superintelligence is this challenge that some people are talking about. Well, what if machines become just so vastly more intelligent than all of humans combined? How do we handle these types of challenges? And is this the most urgent catastrophic uh, risk that could end the, the uh, human civilization altogether? I think these kinds of challenges are not insane. They are real. Uh, but I think they're very hard to predict and prepare for. But I do think that by building technologies and institutions for creating an algorithmic social contract now, we're actually in a better position to be ready for, for the broader challenge, long, the longer term challenge. So thank you.